Hi everyone, welcome back to Life After Neverland. My name is Corinne and I'm so grateful for you to join me today. We are covering The Chosen. We're doing a Bible study with the theme The Chosen. And I have season one here. Forgive my book has been beaten up because I've already done this Bible study. I'm redoing it again and sharing it with the chosen community in the hopes that we can all grow together, do a little deep dive into our soul and connect to God on a deeper level and get to know the TV show The Chosen just a little bit more through the Bible. Dive in deeper, basically into your soul and into the Bible. <laughs> so thanks for joining me. If it's your first time, I have a playlist uh, so you can go back and start from the beginning and catch up with us. I think it's really amazing that you're joining me here live. I hope you stay and connect with me here in the comments section. Uh, I like to have an honest, sincere uh, conversation with the people that join me live. And if you go back and watch it later. I hope that you'll grab yourself a journal so that you can write down some of the study questions and um, really honestly answer those questions in order to um, help you, especially if you're in a time of need. It's really helped me a lot. I feel like when I do it on my own, I don't know how you are, if you like to do it with a group or if you like to do these types of things on your own, but if you like to do it on your own like me, um, all that extra anxiety of having other people around you all the time, um, it helps it to be a little bit more personal. You can open up a lot easier. Today I'm actually working with my husband. He's a home inspector. And so I'm sitting here doing my Bible study because we don't have a lot of time this week. So I'm trying to get my Bible study in when I can. So I'm taking you along with me. I don't know if I said this before, but we are on chapter five. He's always peeking through the windows. <laughs> what a peeping Tom. <laughs> what a show off. <laughs> How rude. <laughs> but anyways, um, we are on chapter five. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and if you have been going along with me, I think it's time for us to get the next book for season two because I'd like to cover that. And then later on, we'll also cover season three and so on as the seasons are available to us. So let's get this pot started. Okay, lesson five says, you are a witness. And it begins with Isaiah 43, eight through 10. Bring out the people who are blind yet have eyes, who are deaf yet have ears. All the nations gather together and the peoples assemble. Who among them can declare this and show us the former things? Let them bring their witnesses to prove them right, and let them hear and say, it is true. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant who I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. But you're here to ask about miracles. But first, I wanted to tell you of a miracle that I've seen, but cannot comprehend. And then to make accusations. This is pointless. Clearly, you are not a frothing madman, but every bit as unreasonable. You imprison me and accuse me of being ill-tempered. I am it. not your captor. Do you not understand? This is a Roman cell. I came here to speak to the warden on your behalf. On my behalf. Why are you really here, old man? The official reason? You are a Jewish citizen. If you have broken Jewish law, it sets a dangerous precedent to allow Rome to adjudicate. Uh, and the real reason? The truth? I am far from home. I am looking and Places I would never go because I am searching for an explanation for something I, I cannot unsee. So my favorite part of this episode literally is Nicodemus coming to John the Baptist in the first place to talk to him about the miracles he experienced when seeing what happened with Mary. Now, 
you've got two different people on two different scales of the spectrum. You've got a Pharisee who knows everything about the Bible, and then you've got John the Baptist who basically lives in the wilderness, and they've imprisoned him in a Roman cell. Yet, Nicodemus is coming to John the Baptist for advice on the miracle he just witnessed. The last person that I would think he would talk to would be someone like John the Baptist. So isn't that profound? <laughs> and even though Nicodemus has come across pretty prideful, I feel at this point in time he's dropping down some of his pride and showing some humble. And um, I find that to be admirable. There are some things about Nicodemus that I really truly do like, and I wanted to ask you guys if you enjoy Nicodemus as well. And also, who is your favorite character in season one? Who touched your heart the most? Now, turn to page 82, and we're talking about blind eyes. Many things vie for our attention. We have set goals and five-year plans, opinions and political affiliations, needs and responsibilities, relationships, and reputations to maintain, and specific ways we want our lives to unfold. But what we prioritize and pursue tends to also be where we place our hope. Hope for happiness, steadiness, wholeness, and the like. It turns out there's nothing under the sun because the people in Jesus' day also had a tendency to misplace hope. In episode 5 of The Chosen called The Wedding Gift, the parents are hoping for a union that will benefit their children and a celebration that will secure their standing in the community. The newlyweds are hoping for a happy, healthy life together, full of love and children and fulfilled dreams. The disciples are hoping that Jesus would interrupt the festivities to make his messianic debut and accelerate their emancipation from Rome. And wedding attendees are hoping for a really good party. <laughs> and nothing is wrong with any of it, except when any of it intrudes on our ability to see, and then do. Now let's go ahead and answer the question on this page. Number one, it says, what are your main priorities in life? Meaning, what things do you spend the most time and energy pursuing? And then it also asks here to please be honest, don't just give like a Sunday school answer. And so that's what I was saying earlier um, when I was introducing myself, is that this kind of forces you to dive a little bit deeper using the theme of the episode as a way to connect more with who you are as a person, but then also with the Bible and God. What does God say about that? And I really love it. I love Bible studies so much, but this one is one of my favorites, obviously. Huh. So that's a tough one. I was listening to a sermon not too long ago, and they basically said that what you're pursuing in your life is your main focus. Like, it's what is most important to you. And the sad part for me is that is I need to find out what those answers are because I think that I am letting life control me. I'm doing what needs to get done every single day and consuming myself with it, and that's not even necessarily work. That's just getting tasks done on a daily basis, and I feel so overwhelmed with tasks that I don't even know what I'm pursuing anymore. <laughs> Lately, this has been my main focus, is uh, pulling myself away from that and doing this Bible study because I truly do want to focus on the Lord more. And I want to grow as a person in that way. I don't want the world to dictate who I am and what I'm going to be. I want to find out who I am through the Bible and through God. So that's my answer. Um, and again, you guys, I know it's hard to answer in the comment section sometimes, and those of you that do, I truly appreciate it because we learn from other people and we can grow and get inspired from other people. And even though this isn't something where we're meeting personally, I would love for you guys to join me. And I didn't mention this before, if you're new coming in, I always meet on Fridays at 12 p.m. Eastern time. But then again, you guys can connect with me by re-watching it on your own time as well. 
who knows, maybe you'll get more out of it by taking time to pause, go back, write things down, and focus more. I find that when I'm multitasking, that's the worst time for me to focus. Or when someone else is doing something next to me, like if I'm in a class, I can't focus. <laughs> I have to be laser focused. I definitely have ADHD, no doubt. Now on to page 83. We've got quite a bit to read here. I'm going to go ahead and read it to you. So here it goes. The Old Testament context. We've spent some time talking about the exodus of God's chosen people from Egypt. But the miracles didn't start there. Before Moses found the courage to enter Pharaoh's throne room and demand the release of the Israelites, God met him in the wilderness. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro and the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, a bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet. For the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmakers. I know their sufferings and have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. Well, hallelujah. <laughs> come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? And God said, But I will be with you. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and then they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And that's in Exodus 3, 1 through 14. And on to page 84, it says, That was a tall order. The pharaohs of Egypt were not only kings, they were considered gods on earth. To stand in front of one and demand anything would have been a death sentence. But Moses had been in the presence of the one true God. He was an eyewitness and couldn't deny what he'd seen or neglect to do what he had been told. Moses was called to serve the king of kings and to appeal to Pharaoh on his behalf. I am who I am was the name God gave himself because it's limitless and because no single word could ever capture the fullness of his character. God is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-seeing, which meant the guy who put Israel in chains was about to face off with the one who'd squash him like a bug and ultimately did. <laughs> Fast forward about nine centuries when Isaiah was appealing to the nation of Israel on God's behalf. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I had chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. Again, Isaiah 4, 3, 10. Time and again, Israel had seen God's power on display in Egypt, through the Red Sea, and into the Promised Land. They'd seen God gather, protect, and provide in the most miraculous ways. But not for their sake alone, and they emphasized that. Not for their sake alone. As witnesses, they were to use their first-hand knowledge to testify to the character and very existence of the one true God to appeal to the people around them who are worshiping false gods 
and believing things that were not true. Do you guys see that today? That people are believing things that are simply not the truth at all? That was the end game, just as it was when Jesus performed miracles. So here on page 85, we have question number two. Ten times Pharaoh refused to free the Israelites. So ten times God unleashed plagues upon the land. How was Pharaoh blind, yet he had eyes, and deaf, yet he had ears? It gives you Exodus 7 through 11 to read. And it's quite a lot, so I'm not going to read it to you. But if you want to pause here, if you're watching it later, and go ahead and read it in your Bible, please do. If you're here with me live, I'm just going to go ahead and sum it up for you, and we'll discuss. In chapter 7 here, it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. For his heart to be hardened, basically as the center of mental, emotional activity, he was supposed to listen and respond appropriately but he failed to respond to any of that. And as an example here, they turned the water to blood, and it says here that Pharaoh turned and went into his house. Neither did he set his heart to this also. And all the Egyptians digged around about the river for water to drink, for they could not drink of the water of the river. And seven days were fulfilled after the Lord had smitten the river. And it just sounds to me like Pharaoh had no intention of doing anything about it. All right, you guys, change of scenery. Sorry about that. I have to get my Bible time in when I can. And so this week, as I said before, is going to be a bit choppy. I wanted to go on to chapter 8. We talked about chapter 7 in Exodus here and why Pharaoh was blind and deaf <laughs> and stubborn. What I wanted to share with you as well is God's character and how he is giving the Egyptians chance after chance after chance after chance, specifically Pharaoh. And he is so stubborn. It does not matter what God throws at them. He still wants to play games. He He's refusing to have eyes to see and ears to hear. So now you have the plague of the frogs. And even still with the plague of the frogs, Pharaoh refuses to let the people go. So now the Lord is going to plague them with lice. And then also, again, refusing. Pharaoh refuses to let the Israelites go. But what's interesting about God's character is that he is protecting the Israelites from all of this after the fourth plague. So nothing can hit them. They are completely protected. So all of these plagues are being bestowed upon the Egyptians and the Pharaoh in order for God to get their attention, I believe. Uh, but the Israelites are fully protected. And so what's happening here is he is showing, the Lord is trying to show Pharaoh and the Egyptians of his presence and how he has ownership of the earth and all of the nations. And yet still, Pharaoh, in my opinion from reading all of this is that he thinks he's the boss and think about this torture here now comes the plague on the cattle so they they're losing their cattle they have the plague of boils and still yet refusing now these are the type of things that happen in the book of revelation which as i've said many times before i think we are nearing the tribulation in which these types of things will happen to people who refuse to repent like Pharaoh here, and God will continue and continue and continue on with plagues and things of that nature. And in the study portion of my Bible, it says here, the Lord could easily have destroyed Pharaoh and his people without the plagues or even hardening the Pharaoh's heart. But these events were designed to show the Lord's incomparability. There is none like him in all of the earth. So man can sit and, um, actually put plagues out into the earth right now and they can create situations where we are also oppressed and held captive and they don't want to let go of that either and I do believe that we're in a situation right now where it's going way too far it's going way too far and God is 
so gracious that you think, wow, this is really rotten that he's doing this. But it says right here, he could have, with a snap of a finger, gotten rid of them. You're done. But he's he is bestowing <laughs> some really serious things onto them. But do you see how they are? They're refusing to comply to him. They're refusing to listen. Now, the Lord brought down hail and also locusts. And even at this time, Pharaoh was saying, I am a sinner, I am a sinner, but it was all words at this point. There was absolutely no action and no fear of the Lord. And Moses was basically saying to him, why are you refusing to humble yourself? It's almost as if at this point, Moses was getting frustrated and angry. I mean, can you even believe how exasperating this is? Because they keep going back, throwing basically the most heinous things at them and still the stubbornness, still the refusal to see and the refusal to hear what God is saying. I mean, how loud can he be at this point? But he even said that he was still even threatening the Israelites and saying things like what they would experience if they wouldn't stop annoying him and just walk away. It says here even that Pharaoh had refused to allow a three-day journey in which was requested. And because he chose to do that, God decided to surround them with complete darkness. And so they were unable themselves to go anywhere for three days. <laughs> that's, that's kind of funny. However, just remember this in knowing God's character. When I do talk about things like the book of Revelation and what could be ahead of us in the future, the Israelites, his people, the ones that feared him, the ones that believed in him, they saw light. They did not have to be covered in darkness. And the Egyptians had to suffer too because Pharaoh was not shaping their relationship with the Lord either. And so therefore, hopefully that gives you guys some examples as to how he was refusing to see and refusing to hear literally when it was slapping him in the face. And so on question number three, page 85, to remind you, in Isaiah 43, 8 through 10, God challenged the people to produce anyone who could prophesy. And then he pointed to the Israelites and said, you are my witnesses because they had experienced his power to prophesy and bring about and conquer and control. In your opinion, what kind of responsibility comes with that kind of knowledge? And just remember that prophesy is the power to announce in advance what will happen, which is what I talk about obviously quite often in all of our series of study. It's the book of Revelation. I'm, I'm mind blown, mind blown by Bible prophecy and eschatology in the sense that it really does prepare you for what is ahead and it is all lining up. I personally believe that if you want to know what God is doing right now and what God, where God is at right now, read Bible prophecy. It's a huge weight and it's a huge responsibility because in the end times especially, no one is going to want to be around during God's wrath. I mean, listen to the things that we just talked about right now. Those are some of the things that happen in the future as well. With the rise of the Antichrist, when the tribulation begins. And I do believe in a rapture. I'm one of the people that believe in a rapture. And that happens prior to the tribulation. When you repent and you tell God that you believe that he and Jesus are one. He came to this earth in a human form. And he died for our sins. And if you believe that, you are saved. You will be raptured and you will not have to go through the tribulation, but you need to tell God that you need to repent for your sins. And you know what? We're all sinners. And even if you're still fumbling around, he knows that he knows that that's our nature as humans. That's why he died on the cross for us. And so it's important for us to let each other know that and that he is our blessed hope. That's another reason why I believe in the rapture, because going into the tribulation and having to live through all that for me is not hopeful at all. And the Lord also says to be encouraged and to encourage one another during this time and to look up because your redemption draweth nigh. Why would he say that? Why would he say that if he's just going to put us through the wrath anyways? But I think with 
relation to Moses, no matter how many times Moses and Aaron went and talked to Pharaoh and the Egyptians, they were refusing. They were hardening their own hearts and God was hardening their hearts, hardening their hearts as well. And I can't help but think, why was he doing that? Because he wants their heart to be with him. So he's testing them. These are tests. But it is, it is a lot of responsibility because just like Moses, they would not listen. They would not listen. They kept wanting to do things their own way and they refused to humble themselves. And it's hard to take on that burden for other people. Um, they might turn and walk away from the Lord. They might turn and walk away from you because they want nothing to do with it. And they most likely could be like in the days of Noah and think you're an absolute cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, weirdy McWeirdo. It's a tough place to be in sometimes. <laughs> okay, so question number four. In ancient times, people worshipped gods made out of wood and stone, the work of human hands as well as people like Pharaoh who made divine claims, though they couldn't back them up. While times and culture have changed, what and who do we worship now instead of the one true God? There's so many things. We, we worship celebrities, Hollywood. We worship <laughs> technology. Can you guys think of anything else? That we worship and that doesn't mean like we're bowing down to it although celebrities yes um but with technology we use technology for everything we rely on technology for everything and if you really do look at ai and where it's going these days it's absolutely terrifying and when you dig and you look even deeper you will realize that they're already talking about putting chips into people And on to page 86, see and tell. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. In Jesus's day, wine was a staple at most meals and a must at every celebration. But at the wedding, the wine had run out and humiliation of epic proportions for the groom's family who was hosting. Jesus' mother took it upon herself to find Jesus and bring him up to speed. They have no wine. Here were her words, but her sense of urgency was clear. Help. Jesus's newly recruited disciples watched as he instructed the servants to fill jars with water. They did as they were told which included taking a glass of water to the master of the feast. At some point between the drawing and the giving, the water turned into wine. The party and reputation of his friends were saved and witnesses of Jesus's true identity were born. Mary Magdalene may or may not have been at the wedding, but being rescued from seven demons had more than convinced her who Jesus really was. She'd been delivered from death, so she followed Jesus to his. She was, in fact, one of the few with him until the very end. But it wasn't just that initial miracle that secured Mary's allegiance to Jesus. It grew as she followed him. She listened intently to his teachings, marveled at his compassion, and became fiercely loyal to the one who healed the oppressed and set captives free. The time she spent with him, along with every subsequent miracle, substantiated what she knew. Jesus was God's son, so Mary was his witness. Nicodemus showed glimmers of belief, but we don't know if he ever fully accepted Jesus as Lord. Scripture makes it clear he had an open mind because he requested a secret meeting with Jesus where he asked a bunch of questions. And you guys remember that in this season, if you've already seen, if you've already watched it. <laughs> he obviously didn't want to be like those who are blind, yet have eyes, who are deaf, yet have ears. And confessed, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. But Nicodemus stopped short of his knowing and understanding that Jesus is the Son of God, at least in that moment. And there's little more record of him in Scripture, which is sad. I really like Nicodemus. 
<laughs> when he chose not to go with Jesus, I was really sad about that. Uh, but Matthew eventually became a follower of Jesus, even writing an eyewitness account in the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew. While we don't know exactly what caused him to abandon his tax booth the moment he was called, we have pretty good idea from Matthew's own account. Getting into a boat, Jesus crossed over and came into his own city. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic laying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And then, said to the paralytic, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and went home. <laughs> Pretty amazing. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at a tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. Perhaps Matthew witnessed the miracle that preceded his calling. Perhaps he believed Jesus had the power to forgive his many sins. Whatever the catalyst, Matthew's eyes and ears were opened. When the moment came, he dropped everything to follow Jesus and became a faithful witness for the rest of his life. Simon, he also believed what he'd seen and heard and was likely one of the disciples in attendance at the wedding in Cana. No doubt, witnessing the water change into wine on top of the miraculous catch of all those fish confirmed his newfound faith that Jesus was, in fact, the Messiah. For the next three years, Simon solidified his allegiance to Jesus, along with his willingness to boldly take God's message of salvation to the ends of the earth. And there's the point. Followers of Jesus see, believe, and they understand that he's the Son of God, the Savior of the whole world. Then like Moses, Isaiah, Mary, Matthew, and Simon, they become witnesses in service to the one true king. So now we're on page 88 and we have question number five where it says the first four books of the New Testament are first century accounts of Jesus's three-year ministry and it's written by guys who were alive at the time. How does knowing that change the way you read them? And that's something about The Chosen that I like and it really captured my attention is that they walked with him, they basically lived with him, and spent most of their days with him. In the past, I've heard people say, well, these are fables. Um, it's just a guideline for you to know how to like live your life and keep order and balance in the world. But I no longer see it like that. I see these as characters who really truly lived and experienced life with Jesus firsthand and their whole mission was to share his word. And, and for us too, yes, I guess that's a half truth, to use it as a guideline for balance and order. And for us to live our best life though, for us to live our best life and for us to be loving of one another in a very cruel, very challenging and, and difficult world where people are evil and do think evil thoughts and many of them act upon them. So how do you handle that? How do you deal with that? And be a believer all at the same time. The world is getting much darker every single day. So even more uh, reasons for me to be grateful for these guys. <laughs> these guys that follow Jesus. And girl, Mary <laughs> Magdalene. Okay, number six is an extremely challenging question, I believe. And so this is something that if you feel like sharing, I would love it. But most importantly, I think it's important, again, like I've said before, is to write this in a journal. Because a lot of the times it's hard to share with other people. The things that you feel in your heart are really deep. And so putting it out on paper is the easiest way to do it. Number six, to be a witness to is to see, hear, or know through personal experience. Describe your personal experience with Jesus and use this moment to testify to your own 
heart about what he's done for you. Well, we did talk a lot about my testimony in my last Bible study. So if you haven't seen that, I encourage you to go back and watch that. Okay, so I, I needed to think about it for a second because I wanted to find the right words to articulate. But um, so I came from a broken family. We've discussed that before. And I'm not unique. Okay, so I'm, I'm not trying to act like, you know, oh, woe well, is me. I came from a broken family. And in a lot of ways, my self-esteem was crushed. And I really honestly fumbled with my relationships all throughout my 20s. And by the grace of God, I really feel like he found my most perfect soulmate for me to spend the rest of my life with. And let me tell you, there have been people, including people in my own family, who have tried to um, plant seeds for this relationship to not work. Friends, family, even when my husband and I got married, people were saying, people that were at our wedding, I got whisperings of them saying that it wasn't going to work out between us. Now, we've been married for 20 years, and it feels like we just got married. He is truly my best friend. It's unconditional love, and it's an experience for me that I've never had before with anyone, with anyone at all. And I know that God actually made him for me and for me for him. I really do believe that. And that is a massive, massive blessing in my life, one in which I am insanely grateful for and that I cherish with all of my heart because I did not experience that growing up at all. And it's just such a wonderful feeling to have someone who loves you like that. God is so wonderful. <laughs> I lost the one person that I really, really had that made me feel that way was my grandfather. And I've mentioned him before too, and I lost him when I was four years old, and it was it was very devastating for me. Um, it was really devastating for me, even though I was really little. But it was really, you know, they think when you're that small that it's not going to affect you. But even in my 40s here, I have such a pain in my heart and my soul over losing someone that I loved so dearly and that I truly trusted, the one adult that I truly trusted more than anyone. So there's that. That's one. That's just one example. But he, even when I lost my father-in-law in the midst, so I'll give you another example, in the midst of such like uh, what I feel is like evil and a nightmare. We lost him during the pandemic. Um, I learned so much. I learned so much. It was literally almost as if God was like, boom, wake up. And I'm you know, I lost my father-in-law, but I'm really grateful, as demented as this sounds, for that experience because I will never, ever turn my back on the Lord um, after what I experienced with that. That will never happen again. And probably one of the reasons, no, one of the reasons why I'm so full force into all of this right now is because I never, ever want to have God not be in my life. I never want that ever again because I saw evil and I um, have no control over it. it. It's a very helpless feeling. I don't know what to do. And so I'm so grateful for him. I'm so grateful for him. I can't and not say that enough. And I know I'm not the only one who was affected by the pandemic. And I just can't help but wonder how many of you went through some things. And did you see God or did you let the evil take over in your life? And if, if that is the case, I encourage you to stay with me. Stay with me, please. And we can get through this together. That would mean so much to me because I, I want to be there for those of you who are feeling hopeless helpless, worthless, lost, confused, and maybe you're in a dark place. And so I want to be there with you through all of that because I've been through all of that. <laughs> but I will tell you, God has been there for me every single time. It didn't mean that I wasn't going to experience these difficult trials. It shaped my character. It helped me become a better person. And it's continually doing that. It's not like, oh, I'm fixed. I'm perfect. No, <laughs> not even close. Not even close. But I know that he's working in me. And it's kind of exciting. And I, 
I'm interested in seeing what else he has in store. And I, and I want the same for you as well. So with that being said, let's move on to page 89 for number seven. The conversation between John the Baptist and Nicodemus in this episode traumatizes Nicodemus's curiosity. He's been seeing things that don't make sense and sincerely investigating. So read Proverbs 34, the verse John quotes in response to Nicodemus, and answer the questions the curious Pharisee couldn't. Who has ascended to heaven and come down? So let's go ahead and read that. Here we are. It's the pureness of God's word. Who hath ascended upon into heaven or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fists? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name? if thou canst tell. And so obviously, God. <laughs> but one of the things it says here in my study, when you talk about Nicodemus, which is really fascinating because he's, like I said before, he's a Pharisee. He knows, he knows the Bible inside and out. But it says, asking about God's name is asking whether the hearer knows his character. Fascinating. Tells you a lot about Nicodemus, eh? <laughs> I mean, Nicodemus is like, seeking information from John the Baptist. But they're putting John the Baptist in a Roman prison. So backwards. This <laughs> is so backwards. It's backwards. You know, I finally went to go see the Jesus Revolution movie and it touched my heart so much. Ah, oh, you guys, I really encourage you to go see it. And I couldn't even believe it because there's this pastor that I follow named Greg Laurie. So if you've already seen the movie, you will realize that it's literally about Pastor Greg Laurie. <laughs> I didn't even know that. I had no idea. And my husband and I, when we were watching it, he looked over at me and he said, did, who related, who did you feel like you related to the most in that movie? And we both agreed that I just very, I very much like Greg. <laughs> and my husband is very much like <laughs> his his wife, his girlfriend in the movie. It's just very fascinating. I loved everything about it. But I encourage you guys to go see it because it showed how in the church, and I've also heard so much about Pastor Chuck Smith and what an amazing man he actually was, and just taking the chance on the hippies like he did was a very risky move because he had a very conventional, straight-laced church. I mean, a very conventional old school church and once he brought those hippies in some of the people in his church they shunned them and it was really quite sad honestly um and then they turned away and literally walked out in rejection of these hippies that just wanted to know god and they just wanted hope in their life and they were willing to turn their lives over to god and i see that time and time again where people who do things that are considered like they're dirty or bad or unclean and other Christians turn their back on them. And that, that to me is, is very painful to see that. I just, I don't believe when you talk about the Lord's character, I believe that those are the people that he wants to talk to. Those are the people that he wants us to encourage, to bring to him. And yet other Christians turn their back on people who are broken and lost and need help. It just makes me so crazy. But honestly, you guys, I hope you see that movie. And people are trying to say, well, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't watch that movie because it's misleading. You shouldn't watch The Chosen because they're misleading you. I'm a perfect example of a person probably like the hippies and like the people that didn't know the Bible that followed the chosen. And then they just assume that because we watch the chosen, we believe everything hook, line, and sinker. No, I'm reading from my Bible right now. We're talking about it. Ay! Yes, the chosen is an anchor, if you will. And the feeling that you get in your heart, because I do believe your relationship with God is 100% of the heart. When we talk about Pharaoh, his heart was hardened. And he did not turn to the Lord. He refused to humble himself. 
Those hippies were humbling themselves and they were giving their testimony. What what is wrong with that? <laughs> ah! Okay, let's move on. <laughs> My exasperation. Ugh. Ugh. Okay. Jesus is the one true king on page 89. Some people say Jesus never claimed to be God, that he was a good man and a powerful teacher, a humanitarian, and an example we should follow, but his followers added the divine part. Incorrect. <laughs> Not only were there witnesses to his miracles, accounts corroborated and recorded by multiple people, he also identified himself the same way God did to Moses. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him. <sighs> it's not a question of whether or not Jesus claimed to be God. Old Testament context makes it clear that he did, which is why the religious leaders wanted to kill him. Rather, the question is, do you believe him? And if you do, what kind of responsibility comes with that kind of knowledge? Here's a hint and one last look at our key verse. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant who I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. As God's chosen people, we are to serve the one true king and worship him alone. And then we are to testify on his behalf, to share our knowledge and experience of God with others, to declare that nothing we do can save us from the consequences of sin. I have so many things to say about it, so while it's in my head, I'm just going to go ahead and say it. Okay, so I was saying to my husband, should I be doing this Bible study? Because I don't want to mislead anybody. I don't want to like turn anybody down the wrong path because I've seen other Christians do that. Even with me, they've discouraged me and made, made me feel, well, not so good things. And I don't want to do that. And then Sean said to me, he said, well, that's what God wants us to do. God wants us to share our experiences with each other, to read the Bible, to talk and commune and share with each other, to help each other grow. And it's so funny because even with my last Bible study that I did, whenever I'm feeling an insecurity in some sort of way, God will encourage me, or at least I feel it in my spirit, in my heart, that that's what I need to do. And when I do, my questions are revealed through the study that I'm doing, which I was just thinking about that yesterday. And then here's my answer to, for confirmation. Like that is an amazing feeling and I'm getting emotional about it, which in, that's my Holy Spirit in my heart. I feel like that's telling me the truth, which I love. Ah, just love it. And it says to declare that nothing we can do can save us from the consequences of sin. And so listen to this, no amount of striving or attaining can satisfy our souls. And no other relationship, the one we have with Jesus, can usher us into the kingdom of heaven. And so these people that turn away from those of us who are in need, broken, dirty, rejected. I mean, for goodness sakes, they're sinners too. And they're turning their back on you saying you're not good enough to worship. That's not okay. That's not okay should never have come here. All your life you've been asleep. Make straight the way for the king. He is here to awaken the earth. But some will not want to awaken. They're in love with the dark. I wonder which one you'll be. And in all honesty, you guys, this is my favorite conversation. Okay, my top three favorite conversations in season one. Number one, the conversation with Jesus and Mary in episode one of season one, in which we covered. This one, the conversation with Nicodemus and John the Baptist. And the third one is the one that we've discussed several times, but which we will see Nicodemus and Jesus have their conversations. My three favorite, even though I have four fingers up, my three favorite conversations, hands down in season one. 
And what I love about this is that John the Baptist literally has to say, because he's a believer, he believes with all of his heart. He has to say to Nicodemus, all your life you've literally been asleep. And then when he says, make straight the way of the king, he is here to awaken the earth, but some will not want to waken. They're in love with the dark. And that is the story behind Pharaoh and a lot of the people in the world that we live in right now. So it says, I wonder which one you will be. Well, let me just tell you right now, uh-uh, no, I don't like the dark. It's making me exasperated. And another thing I wanted to tell you guys, it's so crazy. So I was listening to one of my pastors on YouTube while I was doing my dishes. And you know how different ads come on and things like that. And David Jeremiah, I don't know if you know him. Again, I always like different pastors I like to listen to. Now, he is one of my favorites. And he came on, and I didn't even realize it was an ad. And go, go figure. He was talking about worrying, which is basically what we were talking about in my last Bible study, how I worry about the future, and I drag my past with me. And he, the whole sermon was about worrying. You see how that is working in my life? And I hope it works for you that way too. And I know it does. It has to. It has to. And the crazy thing, oh my gosh, the crazy thing is, I remember um, my mom came to visit um, here. I was born and raised in Iowa, and she came to visit me here. And she came to my father-in-law's church, and they were talking about something really, really heavy. Okay? And later, my mom came to me, and she said, did he do that on purpose? Did, did he say all that because he was trying to, like, come at me and, and get me all upset? No, my father-in-law wasn't. He, 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 he didn't know. Like He had already had his lesson planned before she was even a thought. That is the craziest thing. That message got to her. But what was so sad is that my mom didn't want anything to do with it. And I think when they say that it's hard for us when we want to share the knowledge and we want to give it, to them to help our family members, our friends, or just someone on the street, whoever it is that you want to talk to, um, and they don't want to receive it, it can be very heartbreaking and it can separate you with your relationship. Like, it's so hard to connect after that. I remember I even went to a dance. I don't know if you guys have heard, um, those of you, if any of you, anybody that's watching likes, you know, dance as much as I do. I talk about it all the time. But um, there's actually a dance convention that you can go to. It's called Dance Revolution, and it's all about God. And it's the most amazing thing ever, and I just love it. And all of the kids dance to, you know, worship songs. So they're all really very touching and emotional. My mom was uncomfortable. I brought her with me. In fact, the very last day, they have this insanely massive performance with all these elaborate costumes and props and there's no speaking it's all dancing and they tell a whole entire story and they were doing the story of Adam and Eve and my mom refused to come to see it she decided to sleep in that morning it was the very last day and I remember sitting there feeling so sad because that was really important to me and I wanted my mom to be there and I wanted to share in that experience with her and she just refused and to this day, I, my mom has Alzheimer's now. And to this day, I don't know where my mom is with that. So the only thing for me is to just pray that God will save her. So I pray so hard. But I think that that's, that, that's an example that I can, can use um, when it talks about how difficult it can be sometimes to help others to have eyes to see and ears to hear. And I'm not the type that would like just shove it down someone's throat. If they don't want to listen and if they're, you know, kind of showing me kind of like this sign, like with their body actions and things like that, I, I'm not going to push them because I feel like I'm, I'm going to have maybe possibly do more damage. But I, I always want to lay it out there and hope that they'll come to me eventually. And the sad part is my mom never did. And when you see Jesus Revolution, you'll see Greg. Um, he did things 
that I've done that's really hard. But yeah, if you haven't seen it, I don't want to ruin it for you. So you should see it. It's so good. And you should follow Pastor Greg Laurie. It's pretty amazing hearing his story. It's kind of crazy that I knew that it was... I. It's crazy that I knew that knew about Greg Glory prior to, which makes me excited. Yay! But anyway, here we got some more questions here. Um, on page 90, question number eight says, even in the search for the truth, Nicodemus remained resistant to. What are some factors that cause people to resist? In what areas of your life and to what degree are you resisting? I guess we kind of talked about that like with my mom I can't speak for her. I can't speak for her. I don't know why. Maybe we don't want to be honest with ourselves if we've made mistakes. Because that is really hard to be humble, to, to, to swallow your pride. So pride, um, being humble, taking down your walls and admitting that you made a mistake. Because it is okay to make a mistake. And the only way to get out of that is to ask for forgiveness talk to the other person and and that's where the healing begins and wouldn't you rather have healing i mean for the minor pain that it might cause to admit that you made a huge colossal mistake because in all honesty like because that never happened between my mother and i our relationship was never ever deep it was never there wasn't a connection. The connection was broken. I don't want that with my relationships at all. But at some point you have to accept people for who they are and just love them anyways. You know, maybe from a distance. And in what areas am I resisting? I would say with time, time management which has always been my issue. I definitely want to like dive in deeper in regards to myself, but I, I do think that time is my biggest downfall and or excuse. How about you guys? Which then takes me back to the first question that we had here in the study was about, you know, what do we take our time and energy to pursue in our day? And um, I would like to work on putting God at the forefront of where I put my energy and what I'm pursuing because I really do believe when I start doing that and as I continue to start doing that because I'm doing it very slowly, I need to do better, being honest here. Um, I think that my life will be better. I think we're so used to just like sludging around in the mud that it just becomes part of everyday life. But the more and more that I start reading into this and realizing, it, um, how God truly is and who his character is, how he actually is. I don't want to let other people tell me because sometimes, I mean, I will listen to them, but I have to kind of sift through some of the things that other people say because sometimes you, you'll you come upon those people who will shun you because they think that you're not good enough to be a part of their club of worshiping. And that can make you feel very discouraged. I don't want to feel that way. I want to feel hopeful. All the fruits of the Spirit, yeah, and no longer having this worry problem um, because God's got me, just like he had the Israelites all the time while he was casting all of these plagues on the Pharaoh and the Egyptians who were not being humble and who were resisting. You know what I mean? All right, you guys, we have just a couple more questions here. Number nine on page 90, read John 10, 30 through 33, and then 37 through 39. In spite of the miraculous signs Jesus was doing, some people just didn't believe. Some even hated him. How does knowing Jesus experienced both positive and negative reactions impact your willingness to be a witness for him? So let's go ahead and read John 10, 30, and so on. Okay, John... 30 to 33. I and my father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, many good works have I shewed you from my father. For which of those works do you stone me? 
The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. And 37 to 39, If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though ye believe not me, believe the works, that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. Therefore, they sought again to take him, but he escaped out of their hand. So then back to the last part of this question here where it says, how does knowing Jesus experience both positive and negative reactions impact your willingness to be witness uh, for him? Well, Jesus was rejected too. And I can't help but think to myself, why did he put himself through all of that stuff if he wasn't trying to show us something big and profound and nobody is paying attention and listening to this wonderful message here in this book that most people are highly offended by, like I said, with my mom. And this is not to bash my mom. I love my mom with every ounce of my whole soul. It is heartbreaking when you cannot reach someone that you love that you want to help in a very loving way. And I feel like that's what Jesus does. He does it in a loving way. He's not going to push. He's not going to shove. He's not going to threaten. He's just asking. <laughs> he did it by his own actions. So he was bullied. He was spit on while he was being tortured and preparing to be hung on a cross. Stones were thrown at him. He was judged. Horrible, mean things were said to him and done to him. Yet people don't want to see that. And I find that so confusing. I honestly don't understand that. What's it going to hurt? What's it going to hurt to just believe? But to not believe, it's going to hurt a lot. Because if we truly are living in the end times, which I believe, like I say all the, all the time, we are, we absolutely are, you don't want to be left behind. You really don't want to be left behind. It just doesn't seem fathomable, I think, to some people. I don't even know how to say that word properly. <laughs> On to page 91, we are going to cover our very last question and then finish off with a prayer before I send you on to your lovely weekend. So number 10. Toward the end of the episode, Jesus says to Thomas, come with me and I'll show you a new way to count and measure, a different way to see time. What does that mean? And how does it impact your priorities? <laughs> Boom. Did I not just say how the things that I worry about and then like the question comes up that is in reference to the exact thing that I'm talking about? So crazy. Well, for me to answer this question, I would say, well, I don't really know Jesus. So what does it mean and how does it impact your priorities? Well, okay, so I'm going to put God at the forefront of my priorities. And then I hope he will show me as he's showing Thomas, come with me and I'll show you a new way to count and measure. Please, Lord Jesus, can you do that for me? And maybe anybody who is watching today <laughs> in Jesus name. Amen. <laughs> Seriously. So I'll get back to you on that one. <laughs> it's another windy day today. I know what you're thinking. I know I didn't bring my equipment. Shame on me. Okay, I'll admit it. I made a mistake. <laughs> I'll do better next time. <laughs> and during our prayer time, which is what we're going to do right now, I like to show you little things that I've done throughout the week and or, and or weekend. And so we're going to cue to that while I say our prayer today. Thank you so much for joining me, everyone. I cannot say thank you enough. I hope that you will continue to join me week after week, but much gratitude for you being here today. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and thank you. And for those of you that have subscribed, thank you too. <laughs> Lord, thank you so much for being with us today and for providing your word so that we can grow and learn from the history and the testimony of the people that followed you. Thank you so much for taking intervention into our life and the lives of the people that we love. And Lord, we hope that you will reach our loved ones who aren't quite ready to hear your word. And we hope that you will touch their hearts so that you can save them and bring them closer to you, Lord. We're so thankful that you brought Jesus into our world so that we can understand your power, but also how much you love us. 
Lord, we ask you for courage and opportunities to tell others about you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. And again, everyone, thank you so much for joining me today. Many blessings to you over the weekend and into the rest of your week. I'm grateful for you. I'm grateful for your time. And I'll see you next week for Chapter 6, Lesson 6 of The Chosen, Season 1 Bible Study. Bye, everyone. Until next time, I got to go pick up my puppies. I just got their hair did. See you later, guys. Bye. <laughs>